Well, it's the end of week one here in the fall semester of 2020 at Bethel University. Most of the students are on campus, some are needing to do distance learning, and therefore all of our classes need to be some sort of hybrid model. We are coping, but we'll see how the semester goes. I'm on lecture 13 right now on my videotaping. My students right now are watching lecture 2. Lecture 13A of Differential Equations and Linear Algebra, we're going to start with an application, a mixing problem, more officially called compartmental analysis, and we'll use an integrating factor like we talked about in 12A to solve that. It'll be kind of a tricky calculation, so you want to make sure you pay attention. Then we'll do some theory. Linearity principles about first order linear ODEs, some theorems that we will actually also prove. Now, we won't do a ton of proofs in this class, just once in a while. And in fact, our lack of doing proofs is the main thing that makes this a four credit course in, as opposed to, say, a six credit course. If we were trying to do both a full linear algebra and differential equations course, we would do more proofs than we do. But here is a good place to do it. Introduction to harmonic oscillators is going to be the last topic. This lecture, in fact, both parts, lectures 13 and A and 13 B, are going to be connected. This is going to be a lecture where we're really starting to see connections between differential equations and linear algebra. You can see in 13 B, we're going to review some facts that we've been learning, try to put it all together, linear transformations, matrix multiplication, and inversion. And then I want to introduce the idea of a determinant of a square matrix. So let's start with the mixing problem, compartmental analysis. We've got a tank with a volume of 100 liters that initially has 10 liters of pure water, pure H2O in it. At time t equals zero, salt water with a concentration of 5 grams per liter, we're going to underline that here, a concentration of 5 grams per liter, pours into the tank at a flow rate of 7 liters per minute. You might want to pause and briefly think about how fast that means the salt is entering the tank. At the same time, the drain of the tank is opened so that the fluid in the tank flows out at a rate of 4 liters per minute, different than the inflow. Making a big assumption that's probably not possible to uh, keep this assumption valid completely, we're going to assume the fluid is kept consistently well mixed essentially instantaneously, so we don't have to worry about spatial effects. We don't have to worry about diffusion, because that would be extra complicated. The goal is to find the amount of salt in the tank and the concentration of salt when it fills. Right? It starts with 10 liters of pure water. You know, the inflow rate is 3 liters per minute more than the outflow rate. You've got 90 extra liters to fill up. It's going to take 30 minutes to fill up. So essentially we're trying to figure out what's the amount and concentration at time t equals 30. Start by defining your variables. Let q be the quantity of salt in grams and let t be time, that's a typo right there, in minutes. All right. q is a function of t. Salt water is going into the tank that is initially pure water. The amount of salt is going to go up over time. What is the differential equation that models this situation? It's kind of similar to the financial differential equation, except this time with a minus sign. dq dt, the rate of change of salt with respect to time, comes from two sources. There is the rate at which the salt is going in, minus, not plus, the rate at which the salt is going out. I'm thinking of both of these as positive quantities. I need to subtract rate in minus rate out. That should make intuitive sense. But how do you find that rate in? Well, that goes back to thinking about the uh, flow rate and concentration, like I told you two a minute ago. The flow rate, as far as an um, amount of salt per unit time, if you think about it, it has to be the concentration of the salt going in, in what would the units be? Those, that would be grams per liter, times the inflow rate of the fluid in liters per minute. That's gonna, the liters will cancel and give you grams per minute minus the concentration of the salt going out times the outflow rate. The inflow here is easier to figure out than the outflow. Concentration, that's constant. That is the 5 grams per liter. The inflow rate is constant. That's 7 liters per minute. The outflow rate over here is constant. That's the 4 liters per minute. But what about the concentration of salt going out? That's not a constant. And that's what makes this a harder problem. 
it, and requires a differential equation. The concentration of the salt going out depends on how much salt is in the fluid, but that's changing over time. Here's the answer. Think about it step by step. So here again is the five and the seven. Five grams per liter times seven liters per minute. The liters would cancel and give you 35 grams per minute. Here's the four liters per minute for the, concert, uh, the outflow rate. This right here is the hard part. Q is the amount of salt in grams. It is a function of time. You don't see the of T in there, but you need to remember it's a function of time. The number of liters, the volume, if you think about it, is 10 plus 3T. It starts with a volume of 10 liters right here of pure water. And then we have salt water after that point, but the total volume, assuming the salt doesn't take it, itself doesn't take up any volume, can be modeled this way as 10 plus 3T, once again, because uh, the difference between the inflow and the outflow is 7 minus 4, which is 3. And you can see when T is up to 30, this will give you 10 plus uh, 3 times 30 is 10 plus 90 is 100 liters. The tank will be full. We also have pure water at the start. Q of 0 equals 0. I didn't have to start with pure water. I could have started with some amount of salt to begin with, but I decided to start with pure water. There's our initial value problem that we need to solve. All right, so now I'm going to show you all the details. This does get extra tricky, and in fact, I made some mistakes when I was trying to solve it. I think I've double-checked this enough that there's no mistakes. I'm going to use the method of integrating factors. So first I have to figure out what the integrating factor is. Lecture 12a was about that to some degree. You need to take this linear differential equation, dq dt equals this, 35 minus 4q over 10 plus 3t, that is linear in q. And, well, if we're going to use the method of integrating factors, remember the term that involves the dependent variable, usually it's a y, this time it's a q, needs to get put onto the other side so that it's in the um, linear operator form. So we need to add 4q over 10 plus 3t to both sides. And then once I've done that, the thing in front of the q, the 4 over 10 plus 3t, is going to be what I call g of t. And the integrating factor, well, here it is, here's the differential equation the integrating factor is going to be e to the integral of this thing. Do you remember that? From lecture 12a? Here it is. The if, the integrating factor, mu of t, e to the integral of that thing. I think I said integral before? Yeah, there's an integral. So you've got to do that integral and then simplify. You don't need to add the plus c. You can take c to be 0. It's fine. So we only want one antiderivative of 4 over 10 plus 3t. And if you think about it, it's this. If you can't figure that out real quickly, you can do a substitution to help you figure it out. You could let u equal 10 plus 3t, and then du would be 3 dt, and you'd get this. Now, technically, that is the integrating factor, but it's nice to simplify it. Use a property of logarithms. Bring this coefficient of the ln up into the power of its input. That's a property of logarithms that we can do here to get that. And then e to the x and ln of x are inverse functions. They cancel, so to speak, leaving us with this function, 10 plus 3t to the 4 thirds power as the integrating factor. Kind of a strange integrating factor, you might say. What do we do with it? We multiply both sides of this differential equation by it. And then something kind of magical happens. It seems magical, though I did give you the reason for it in lecture 12a. When you do that on the left side, this is designed to make the left-hand side the derivative of q times the integrating factor um, because of the product rule. Here it is. Here's what you get when you do the multiplication right here. The q dt times the integrating factor is right there. 4 over 10 plus 3t times q times the integrating factor is right there because 10 plus 3t to the 4 thirds uh, divided by 10 plus 3t is the same as 10 plus 3t to the 1 third. Subtract the exponents. 4 thirds minus 1 is 1 third. And this thing is this derivative by the product rule. And remember, q is not a constant. It's a function of time. I'm just not putting the of t in there. Take the derivative of this. You get the first function, 
10 plus 3t to the 4 thirds times the derivative of the second function, dq dt, plus the second function, q over here, times the derivative of the first. The derivative of 10 plus 3t to the 4 thirds, think about it here. You bring down the 4 thirds in front, you'd subtract one from the exponent, 4 thirds minus 1 is 1 third. Then because of the chain rule, don't forget the chain rule, you'd multiply times the derivative of 10 plus 3t, which is 3. And that would cancel with the 3 in the 4 thirds. 4 thirds times 3 is 4. That's where the 4 comes. Common mistake people make when they use integrating factors is they forget to multiply it on the right side. We have to do it over here, too. So I took 35 times 10 plus 3t to the 4 thirds. Got to do that. Otherwise, you get the wrong answer. And why is this good? This function is certainly a factor, but we call it an integrating factor because, because it is, is of this form, the left-hand side, because of the product rule, it's easy to integrate. Integrated derivative gives you the function. The integral and the ddt cancel. There are inverse operations to give you this right there. But you've got to integrate the right side, too. And you should take the time to check that this is right. I mean, actually, the quickest way to check that this is right is to differentiate this. Bring down the 7 thirds, you get 35 thirds times 10 plus 3t to the 4 thirds times 3. The 3s are cancel again, giving you 35 times 10 plus 3t to the 4 thirds. Here you do want to put the plus c because we want to solve, we want the general solution and we want to solve the initial value problem. It's for the integrating factor that you can take c to be 0. Yeah, remember the goal. We want to solve for q. So now divide both sides by 10 plus, oops, that's a typo there, 10 plus 3t to the 4 thirds. Divide both sides by that. Get this. Make sure there's no typos there. Yeah, divide this by 10 plus 3t to the 4 thirds. 7 thirds minus 4 thirds is 1. You get a first power there, right? There's a first power there. Don't forget to divide the c by it as well. So you get c divided by 10 plus 3t to the 4 thirds. Here you can distribute the 5 through, if you like, to get 50 plus 15t, and leave this as is. There is a general solution of the differential equation. dq dt equals 35 minus 4q over 10 plus 3t. Now solve the initial value problem as well. q of 0 is 0. So plug in q equals 0 and t equals 0. What will you get? You get 0 equals 50 from this term right there plus c over 10 to the 4 thirds. Plug in t equals 0 there and there. This is what you get. Solve for c. So subtract 50 from both sides and then multiply both sides by 10 to the 4 thirds and c is negative 50 times 10 to the 4 thirds, which of course we can approximate right away, but let's just get the answer in exact form. Plug it back in. There's our unique solution of the IVP. All right, now we can use it to solve the problem. Find the amount of salt and the concentration. This is a quantity, Q, of salt in grams. Plug in T equals 30 to find the amount. And you can check in your calculator. It turns out to be approximately 492.679 grams. And then the concentration would be to just divide that by 100 liters to get it in grams per liter. Right? It's right the instant when the tank fills up, I guess you turn off the faucet, you um, stop the drain. What's the concentration? Divide that by 100, it's about 4.93 grams per liter. Which makes sense. It's close to, where is it? It's close to 5. The concentration of what was going in. And remember, it started with 0 salt at time zero, time 0. So that this makes good sense that we maybe should be, well, for sure under 5, but yeah, I mean, 30 minutes has gone by. It makes sense that maybe we'd be close to 5. I'm happy. Yeah, so my own, only mistake is I forgot the three right there. Okay, I think I'm pretty sure this is right. All right, on to the theory. This is really important theory, especially in connecting this to linear algebra. Again, it, it does make sense to combine differential equations in linear algebra in one course for many people's purposes. These theorems, just tell my students, are in the textbook. I'm, writing these as you find them in the textbook, the Blanchard, Devaney, and Hall textbook. First, we have a linearity principle for first-order linear homogeneous ODEs. 
first order because it only involves a first derivative. Linear because it's of the form O linear, O to E. It's going to be homogeneous, so when you write it in linear operator form, we'd have a zero on the right-hand side. O to E means ordinary differential equation. It's a theorem where you make some assumptions, some hypotheses. If YH is a solution of this, there is our first order homogeneous linear O to E. If we wrote it in linear operator form by subtracting A of T Y from both sides, we'd have dy dt minus a of t y equals zero. The fact that the right hand side is zero makes it homogeneous. The conclusion is then k times y h of t is also a solution for any constant k. You can multiply any solution by a constant and get another solution. Hmm. And if a of t was a constant, yh would be c times e to the, call it a, t power, if a, a of t was the constant a. And c is arbitrary, so you could multiply c by k and get another arbitrary constant, k times c. It, this makes sense in that context. But it does apply even if a of t is an arbitrary function of t here. Let's look at the proof of this. Okay, so again, we're not doing a ton of proofs in this class but I think this is a good point to look at the proof and be able to do proofs like this, linearity proofs I call them, because it's related to linear algebra. It will supplement your understanding of linear algebra. So how do you do the proof? Go ahead and say that the hypothesis is true, assume it's true, or say suppose y h of t solves dy dt equals a of ty that first order homogeneous linear ODE. Okay? Not much to do there, right? That feels pretty easy. The next sentence is hard. What do I say next? It is a good idea in this context, in this type of proof, to write down next what this means. This means left-hand side equals right-hand side when I substitute. I'm going to go ahead and use the prime notation in this context instead of the DDT notation. YH prime of T, that's the left-hand side of the differential equation when I substitute that function, equals the right-hand side of the differential equation when I substitute the function in place of Y. A of t times y h of t, and here I'm being explicit about the t's, for all t in the domain, whatever that domain happens to be. Now, I'm not worrying about saying what the domain is here, so I'm being a little sloppy in that sense. I'll just say for all t. I could say for all appropriate t. I'm going to introduce you to a kind of a fun notation here. I might have shown this to you before. An upside down a means for all. Mathematicians have to find uh, ways to make this fun in some ways. And so one way they make it fun is they make up crazy looking notation. This means for all. Isn't that fun to make it upside down? For all t. In whatever domain we're talking about, we're not going to worry about it. Okay? Um, there's another notation that's similar to this. A backwards E, backwards E like this, means there exists. This is called the universal quantifier, upside down A, it means for all. This is called the existential quantifier, backwards E, it means there exists. But I don't, I don't need that in this proof, so I'm going to erase that. Then you have to ask yourself, what do I want to show? I want to show that this function is a solution, no matter what K is. Maybe I should say, let k be a constant. I want to show that's a solution, k times y h of t. Is it trivial? I mean, how do you, how do you show that? You do need an important fact. You do need to quote an important fact here. 
And that fact you could describe as the linearity property of the derivative operator, which you did learn about in calculus. By the linearity property I capitalized the L, the linearity, I didn't need to there. Maybe, or maybe I should capitalize the P, but I didn't. <laughs> By the linearity property of derivatives or differentiation, when we plug K, Y, H, and T into the left-hand side of the differential equation, here I'm going to use DDT. DDT of K, Y, H of T, I mean, I could have just put a prime out there as well. I'm mixing the primes and the DDTs. Equals, you can just bring the constant out in front. And maybe here I'll use prime. K, Y, H prime of T. For all T. Let me just do it this way. It's true for all T. In whatever the domain happens to be. Okay, what should I do now? I said this means this when I assume y is solve the differential equation. I haven't used that yet. That should set off light bulbs in your mind. I, I probably need to use that. Otherwise, what's it worth to make that assumption? Yeah, go ahead and use that now. This equals k times this, because y prime, y h prime of t equals this, and I got a y h prime right there. Does that do it? Are we done? Almost. I really should use the associative property next to really, uh, well, and along with the. Um, the commutative property as well. I'll just do it in one step. Bring the A of T out in front. So I'm using the um, associative property of multiplication. I can move these parentheses here, for example, K times A of T. And then the uh, commutative property of multiplication, the K and the A of T can get switched around. And then I could use the associative property again I guess I used three steps there, two associative properties and one commutative property to get from here to here. And that is the way you should end it because that function right here matches this function right here. I've shown that the derivative of k, y, h of t is a of t times itself for all t. That's what tells me I'm done. I could maybe add a little bit more to this to make it nicer. I could say, by properties of algebra, I could, or I could also I could quote the properties themselves by the associative and commutative property, which you know we have talked about with linear algebra as well, though we talked about that more in the context of vector addition. Here we're talking about number multiplication. I won't bother. Okay. Mathematicians, when they finish proofs, they typically write QED, that's Latin for quad erat demonstrandum, or that is the Latin. It means I demonstrated what I wanted to demonstrate. I, as a Christian mathematician, also say PTL for praise the Lord, we're done. Okay? But you've got to know you're done. <laughs> that's another hard thing about proofs, is you've got to know when you're done. All right. Um, I need to erase this, I think, now. Maybe take a picture of it, of it if you want to take a screenshot because the, the next thing covers it. Yeah, okay. Oh, it's so beautiful. I don't feel like erasing it, oh, but I have to. All right. Um, also in the Blanchard Devaney Hall book, there is an extended linearity principle. By the way, you might be scratching your head and wondering what these principles are good for. We'll talk about that too. Extended linearity principle. If y h of t is any solution of the homogeneous equation, same one as before, and y p of t, hmm, p for particular, h for homogeneous, 
is it any solution of the non-homogeneous equation where I put a plus b of t in there, then yh plus yp, this should feel familiar, like undetermined coefficients method here, is a solution of the non-homogeneous equation as well. That's not the only part of this extended linearity principle. Second part is that if yp and yq both solve the non-homogeneous equation, then their difference is a solution of the homogeneous equation. All right, I think for sake of time, I'm not going to do the full proofs of these. Let me just give you the idea. Idea of proof. Say for the bull, first bullet, what's the key idea? You are still going to need the linearity of the derivative operator, and you're still going to need algebra facts, like associative and or commutative properties and that kind of thing, maybe even the distributive property here. You would need to assume yh solves this and yp solves that, and you'd need to show yh plus p solves this. So you need to essentially plug that function in the left-hand side and see if it equals the right-hand side. The key calculation is that ddt, the derivative of yh of t plus yp of t by a linearity of the derivative operator is yh prime of t plus yp prime of t And since you are assuming yh solves this and yp solves this, that would mean you can make some replacements. The yh prime could get replaced by a of t, yh of t, and the yp prime, since it solves this one, can be replaced by a of t, yp of t, plus b of t. And then, by the distributive property, you could factor out an a of t out of these first two terms. And that would essentially do it. That's, these are the key equations that verify it without writing the sentences and without saying the reasons for things. The derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivatives. That's linearity of the derivative. Then use the assumptions about yh and yp, which differential equations they solve to make these replacements. Then use algebra to factor out the a of t out of the first two terms. And that is the right-hand side of this non-homogeneous equation when you plug in yh plus yp in place of y. And that's what you would need to show to verify it's a solution. Uh, as far as the second bullet here, it's actually a pretty similar thing except with um, different notation and different assumptions. This would be a y p, this would be a y q, and this would be a minus sign. And the minus sign by linearity would go there, and this would be a p, and this would be a q. And you'd get something similar to this here, except with a p and a p, and then you'd ha have the, oh, wait a minute. Okay, it's not quite similar at that point. Okay. Um, I won't write it out, but you would, you get yp prime of t equals this thing with yp in place of y, and yq prime of t equals this thing with yq in place of y, and you're subtracting them, the b of t's end up canceling. And that's why the difference solves the homogeneous equation. Um, let's focus on the importance of the second one for uh, what we did with undetermined coefficients. Remember the method of undetermined coefficients to solve the non-homogeneous equation? You consider the associated homogeneous equation, find its general solution, call it yh. And then you find a particular solution of the non-homogeneous equation by educated guessing. And then we said yh plus yp was a general solution of the non-homogeneous equation. Essentially, this first bullet point says you are going to get a solution when you do yh plus yp. And the second bullet point says it essentially is going to be the only solution, because if you found some other solution uh, and you subtracted yp from both sides, it would solve the homogeneous equation. The difference of two solutions of this would solve it. And that, in essence, means it's going to be the only type of solution. Oh, all right. Um, on to the next slide. The next slide is a restatement of these exact same principles, theorems, but with slightly different perspective. 
If YH is in the current kernel, is that a typo? No, it's not a typo. Of the linear operator, which is just another name for a certain kind of linear transformation, T of Y equals dy dt minus A of ty, then k times yh is also in the kernel of t for any constant k. Wait a minute. With linear transformation? Yeah. This is a linear transformation. Not with ordinary vector inputs and outputs that are from n-dimensional space or m-dimensional space or whatever, but with inputs that are functions of T in this case, and outputs that are functions of T. Hmm. Why would such a thing be a linear transformation? We're going to talk very soon about what are called function spaces, which are examples of a more general concept called a vector space. Rn, n-dimensional space, is also an example of a vector space, a more concrete example, you might say, that we're more used to. But we're going to talk about what are called function spaces as well. And T is going to be a linear transformation from a certain function space to another function space. And its inputs are functions and its outputs are functions. T, T is a function whose inputs are functions and whose outputs are functions? Yes, it is. Because of the word function occurring so often, we often then call it either an operator or a transformation. And it is linear. Um, why is that not working? T of one function plus another function, for example, is by the linearity of the derivative, like we were just talking about, and by the distributive property. suppress the of t's and some of this stuff here. It equals y1 prime minus a2 y1 plus y2 prime y2 prime minus a of t y2 which equals t of y1 plus t of y2. That's, that's an operation preserving kind of property. And I could have put scalars in there as well, an alpha and a beta. Alpha y1 plus beta y2, like we've been doing otherwise with linear transformations. This is a linear transformation, a different kind of linear transformation between function spaces. And the kernel is the set of all functions in this case that get mapped to the zero function, the function that's always zero. That's why I said put the word kernel in there. The other one, same linear transformation, linear operator. If yh is in the kernel of t and the image of yp under t is b of t, you don't see a b of t there. In other words, t of yp equals b, which means Yp solves the non-homogeneous equation, even though you don't see a b of t there. It's over here. Then the image of their sum under t is also b of t. We could write it like that. In this notation here and here, I'm not writing the little t's, but they're there in your mind. You need to realize they're in the background. Second bullet point was that if the image of Yp of t, Yp under capital T is b of t, then the, and the image of yq is the same thing, then the image of their difference is zero. It's in the kernel. The difference is in the kernel. It gets mapped to the zero function under this linear transformation. Okay? So these are just different ways of saying the same thing, but now we see some connections to linear algebra. Kernels, for example. Last thing to do in this lecture is simple harmonic motion. Three slides I want to get through in 10 minutes here, maybe even less if we can. Okay, we have talked about this a little bit. Let me go kind of fast. Consider a mass on a spring. Here's a picture. 
There's your mass, there's your spring. The spring attached to an immovable wall. The mass, you want to grab the mass and pull it and then let it go, right? Back and forth it will go. Or you can compress the spring and let it go. Back and forth it will go. Whoops. The block has mass M. Let's use standard units, kilograms. The spring has spring constants or stiffness constant K. The units for that would be newtons per meter. I won't explain why at the moment. And let Y be the displacement of the block from equilibrium in meters. Equilibrium is the location of the block when it's not moving. Let's pretend this is the location of essentially the center of mass of the block when it's not moving. Let's call this Y equals zero. The, the positive Y axis is going to the right here. When the mass is to the left of zero, its uh, displacement is negative. You could also call this position. Okay, but it's position with respect to zero being at the location of the center of mass when it is at rest. Y can be negative. We are in the undamped case, which means no friction present. Ha ha ha, La laugh out loud. Of course there's friction present. Okay, you could try to minimize friction by making this ice down here, putting this in a vacuum, but you still couldn't get rid of the friction in the spring itself. So of course there's always friction, so this is not going to be an accurate model, at least not for the long run, but maybe friction is low enough that it's decent in the short run. It's a mathematical modeling, it's not perfect. So you start, try to start simple and see if it's good enough. And if it's not good enough, then you make it more complicated and still hopefully you can still analyze it. There's something called Hooke's Law that says something called the restoring force of the spring is negative ky, where k itself is positive, so that negative k is negative. What's this about? Um, think of it this way. If I pull the mass this way, stretch the spring, then the spring wants to pull it in the negative direction. The force is in the negative direction. And it's proportional to the magnitude of y. The further I pull it, the harder that spring is going to pull. On the other hand, if I can push the mass toward the wall, if I compress the spring, making y negative, then the restoring force is in the positive direction. Negative of a negative is positive in that case. Is it really proportional to y? Not, it's not a perfect law. Okay? It's, it's an approximation. It certainly does, does not apply when the spring breaks, if it does break. Okay. Newton's second law says that F equals ma. A is the second derivative of y with respect to t, right? Acceleration is the second derivative of position with respect to time. You could also write that double prime. M is positive. It's the combining of Hooke's law and Newton's second law that gives you a differential equation, which is, um, yeah, this right here. So I combined them. I brought the, the m times the second derivative of y with respect to t right there. I set that equal to negative ky. I put that right there. It's the setting these equal to each other that gives you the differential equation. You can write it in this form. You can also divide both sides by m and write it in that form. You can also add k over m y to both sides and write it in this form. And in fact, in this form, we emphasize that it's homogeneous because you have a zero right there. It is second order because we have second derivative involved right there. We also see it's common to write it this way, where q is k over m, just to reduce the number of uh, parameters in this makes it a little, little easier to think about. But you always want to remember that q is k over n because then it is also useful to re relate it to k and n. Yeah, a single scalar second order differential equation. What's the goal? The goal is to solve for y as a function of time. Do you think you could guess the general solution? I bet if you paused the video and thought about this hard enough for even maybe just a minute or two, you might be able to guess the general solution, maybe. Mass is going to oscillate back and forth like a cosine or a sine function. It's got to involve maybe both cosine and sine, depending on the initial conditions. The only real question is what are the amplitudes and what are the, what's the periods? 
Here is the answer. General solution of the undamped simple harmonic oscillator equation can be written like this. I also could have used Q instead of K over M, but I decided to put the K over M in there. Why does that work? Take its second derivative. You need the chain rule twice. You'd end up getting an extra factor of square root of K over M twice for each term. And square root of K over M squared would be K over M. If you think about it, you get a negative a times k over m times cosine of this for the second derivative, and a minus b times square root of k over m times sine of this for the second term. It's negative k over m times itself. Yeah, that, that was just a verbal confirmation that this solves that differential equation, thinking of it uh, this way, right there. Second derivative is negative k over m times the, itself. You're going to need two initial conditions here to solve for these two unknown constants, A and B. An initial position, call it Y sub zero, an initial velocity, call it V sub zero, and you'd need to, yeah, hopefully you'd have particular numbers there you could solve for A and B. I'm not going to do that now, I'll wait for lecture 14A. This course, here's something important, the corresponding first order system of differential equations related to this starts by defining v to be the derivative of y with respect to t, and v is suggested, but this is the velocity. I'm about to convert the second order scalar equation to a first order system. This is really important for our class, both for implementing Euler's method in higher dimensions and for thinking about phase planes in this context. The system is this, a system of two first order equations. You see first derivatives there, dy dt is v, that's nothing more than this definition of what v is. dv dt is the second derivative of y with respect to t twice, which we knew is negative k over m times y, like I mentioned just a minute ago. This first order system of differential equations is equivalent to the original single scalar second order differential equation. I keep saying the word scalar, why? Because this is equivalent to a vector equation that involves matrices, another connection to linear algebra. Let capital Y, both phase, be the vector, little y, little v. The components are little y, and little v. This, this is a function of t, keep this in mind. These are, this is not a constant vector. I could have put the of t's in there, but I'm suppressing it. The derivative of that with respect to t would have components dy dt and dv dt. Why? It's essentially a definition. Makes sense. And I can replace this vector with these two things because I'm assuming it's a, I want something equivalent to the system of differential equations. That's what I did. Replace dy dt with v, replace dv dt with negative k over m y. And hey, that's a linear combination of vectors, where y and v are your scalars. y times this vector plus v times that vector. And that would mean this is a matrix times a vector, right? Linear combination of the columns of the matrix with the components of the vector as the weights. It's this matrix times this vector, which I could also write this way. And my differential equation then becomes dy dt equals capital A times y, y, where y is this vector and A is this matrix. Wow, connection to linear algebra. And this is analogous to, in a scalar form, dy dt equals little a times y, a linear differential equation whose solutions we've memorized to be exponential functions. I wonder if the solution is something like this is an exponential function too. It will be, but it'll be a something called a matrix exponential, as we will see. Final slide. Oh, it took 10 minutes. A uh, vector form of the general solution, it turns out, looks like that. I'll let you check this. Essentially, I just found the derivative of y using the chain rule. Put those in the vector for y, and then separated it out with the constants that are arbitrary in front. It's a vector form of the general solution. 
And if, for example, we take m to be 1, k to be 1, a to be 1, and b to be 0, then we get this particularly simple function. And we want to graph it in a yv plane, which is going to be a phase plane, a, a two-dimensional phase plane. And a static diagram would look like this, if you graph it. This is a parametric curve. These are parametric equations, essentially, that you learned about it even in pre-calculus. And if you graph it, it's a circle going clockwise. You might want to think about what that means for the motion of the mass. We're keeping track of how the position and velocity of the mass change. But we can also animate that. Here I'm letting t go from 0 to 4 pi, actually, so you go around the circle twice. And I purposely put a couple of vectors in the picture. The red vector to the black dot is the position like vector of the black dot. The pink vector is the velocity vector of the curve, not the mass in the spring. It's not the velocity of the mass in the spring. That's given by this scalar quantity v. That pink vector is a velocity vector for the curve. Now, don't be bothered by the fact that it goes backwards. Focus on the forward motion. It's a velocity vector for the curve. It's always tangent to the curve. And its length is actually the rate of change of the distance traveled versus time. It's, it's a speed. And that velocity vector will follow something called a vector field for the system of differential equations, which you don't see anymore. A vector field is a higher dimensional system version of a slope field. Okay? Lots of these things to come. Thanks for watching.